Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? There we go. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, hear that's you? nice. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to uh, start. So. Oh, you just give me a second. Can you allow me to share screen? Uh, okay. okay. So good morning, everybody. So it's um, a privilege to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Dave Estrada, uh, who is um, leading exciting projects at the University of Boise in the United States. Um, so let me uh, read a little bit about his achievements and uh, career path. So David Estrada is original from Napa, and he served in the United States uh, as an electronics warfare technician, and he achieved the rank of ready officer first class in 2003 before receiving an honorable discharge and returning uh, to pursue uh, his undergraduate education at the Boys State University when he was a uh, Ronald McMahon. Mm -hmm. So after completing his BC in electrical engineering from the BSU in May 2007, he became a civil graduate student at the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign under the direction of Professor Eric Paul. So David received his Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from the uh, Urbana-Champaign in 2009. Uh, his Doctor of Philosophy in Electrical Engineering also in Urbana-Champaign in 2013. So David enjoyed uh, Professor uh, Rashid Bashir Laboratory of Integrated Biomedical Microtechnology application as a visiting postdoctoral researcher before moving to the material science and engineering department at Boise State University. So David is the recipient of the NSF graduate fellowship and his work has been recognized with several awards, including the Gregory Stillman, John Bardeen, and SHPE Innovator of the Year Awards. So his research interests are in the areas of emergency and conductor nanomaterials uh, and the other technology. So, Professor Dave, thank you so much for accepting our invitation in social notice. And I think we are ready to uh, start. Great. Thank you. I hope you can uh, hear me okay. And uh, looks like I'm sharing screen there. So, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for the invitation to share my work with you. So, today I'll talk a little bit about uh, our work in uh, printed electronics. Um, and printed devices using two-dimensional materials. And towards the end of the talk, I'll highlight some recent work where we are moving into metal organic chemical vapor deposition of two-dimensional materials. So um, I usually like to start with this slide to tell you a little bit about Boise State University and where, where we're located and kind of what's in our region. So if you're not familiar with us, we are a, a research um, intensive university. Uh, one of the three research universities in the state of Idaho. And we are located here in the southwest corner in uh, the capital city of Boise. Uh, so Boise, you may know, is home to Micron Technology. Micron is a global manufacturer of DRAM and other memory technologies. And so we do have quite a big uh, semiconductor industry here in the Treasure Valley in, in, in Boise. So not only do we have Micron, we have On Semiconductor, which makes a lot of power electronics, CMOS imagers, uh, American Semiconductor, which is a small company, but they make flexible silicon uh, integrated circuits um, at the 300 millimeter wafer scale. 
And then we have Photronics, which is a NASC manufacturer, and they make masks for like Samsung, TSMC, IBM to get to kind of current state of the art technologies uh, in semiconductor industry. And of course, we have the tool vendors supporting uh, the, the fabrication facilities. Micron recently announced a $15 billion fab for memory uh, being built here in, in Boise. And that construction is underway. Um, also in the state of Idaho, out in the eastern part of the state, we have one of the 17 Department of Energy <laughs> National Laboratories. I do have a joint appointment with Idaho National Laboratory, which is the uh, Applied Engineering Laboratory for the Nuclear Energy Office. And the three research universities, Boise State, uh, University of Idaho, Idaho State, collaborate with Idaho National Lab in our Center for Advanced <laughs> Energy Studies, which is shown here on the bottom right, this 55,000 square foot facility located in Idaho Falls so that we can work uh, collaboratively in that space with the um, government scientists. And then, of course, uh, I don't know how much you guys follow American football, but Boise State is pretty well known uh, in, in football uh, for our blue turf. And I think we're actually ranked uh, in uh, the top 25 this year. So my lab is the Advanced Nanomaterials and Manufacturing Lab. And I like to put this uh, slide up just to show you the breadth of the, the work we're doing uh, in, in my team, right? So kind of at the core of what we work on are two-dimensional materials, nanomaterials. And we really do try to understand some of their fundamental properties, whether that's electrical transport, uh, thermal transport, their optical properties, and things of that nature. But then we try to apply them in these different sectors like healthcare, energy, and the environment. And we try to do this all through kind of a manufacturing lens so that we can translate our fundamental discovery to commercial application and hopefully get picked up by industry so I'll talk a lot about uh, today about how we make inks that are compatible with inkjet printing, uh, aerosol jet printing, right? These are kind of technologies that are compatible with roll-to-roll -roll, uh, manufacturing. And then I'll, uh, towards the end, talk about MOCVD, which is of course already adopted in industry, but our tool um, kind of bridges that TRL four to six level for uh, 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 translation of MOCD, MOCVD to industrial scale. A lot of what I'll talk about is really focused on the energy space today. Um, and uh, like I said, we do a lot of work with two-dimensional materials uh, in, in that space. So why, why are we interested in 2D and layered materials for this application? I, I really like this chart from Chavez uh, that was in 2D materials and applications a couple of years ago, which kind of maps the different um, materials uh, uh, across the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And so if you look down here, you can see their band gap uh, energy on the bottom, and then the uh, corresponding wavelength on top. And the 2D materials family bridges from ultraviolet all the way to metallic type behavior, right? So hexagonal boron nitride, for example, is a two-dimensional sheet of uh, um, boron and nitrogen, which could have a band gap of up to 6 eV. And so that could be an uh, insulating element for electronics, whereas some of the transition metal decocogenides, which are a transition metal sandwiched by either sulfur, selenium, or tellurium, uh, tend to be within that visible range of band gap. Um, for example, the 2H phase of MOS2 can bridge from 1.3 eV in the bulk, in indirect band gap semiconductor. And when you get down to the monolayer, it's 1.8 eV direct band gap, right? And a lot of the TMDs exhibit this type of behavior. But when you go to the 1T phase, um, these can become metallic. And uh, other metallic uh, elements might include, for example, graphene and uh, maxines, which I'll talk a little bit about today. So with these, based on their atomic structure, um, their phase, and uh, uh, their chemical composition, we have all the elements in 2D materials to make uh, multifunctional inks for our additive manufacturing electronic tool sets. Um, and so uh, additive electronics manufacturing is just kind of the new term, I think, for printed electronics, because it, it uh, you know, it does this in an additive fashion, and printed electronics is often um, associated with screen printing or uh, uh, gravure type printing. And so um, I think that's a little more encompassing of the, not just the printer technologies, but just the field in general. And so uh, some of the advantages for advanced uh, or additive electronics manufacturing, we do this in an additive fashion and not subtractive. So we can uh, save on material, uh, rapid prototyping, reduced costs and things of that nature. But the tools that we have at Boise State are really uh, just focusing today on materials jetting platforms. And of those, we have inkjet, aerosol jet, and plasma jet printers. Inkjet is by far the most developed technology. And the way it works is you have a piezoelectric uh, print head 
where you apply a voltage pulse to the piezoelectric material, you cause mechanical deformation to the piezoelectric effect, which squeezes the ink, overcomes the surface tension at the nozzle, and the droplet falls down to the substrate, right? And so once you have your print and your ink on the substrate, we then do some type of thermal sinter or uh, flash UV to remove any solvents and uh, kind of get the particles to coalesce into a functional film. Uh, inkjet has about a 30 micron drop size, so your spatial resolution can be limited to uh, around the tens of microns, probably around 50 microns. Uh, contact angles for wettability need to be about 20 to 30 degrees to get a good uh, uh, print. And your viscosities are limited to about 2 to 12 centipoys, with particle sizes recommended to be less than 50 nanometers to avoid clogging the nozzle. One thing with uh, we have to take into account when designing our inks are the solvent vehicles that are carrying our particles, because a lot of times the solvents are not compatible with the print tool themselves, and we want to avoid corrosion or toxic fumes for the operator. Right, so we also have to be very careful in what kind of solvents we're using for the ink synthesis. Aerosol jet printing is a newer technology than inkjet. It came out of a DARPA program in the early 2000s, as long, alongside the Enscript uh, extrusion printer. But the way aerosol jet works is you have your ink sitting in a glass vial within an um, ultrasonic bath, and you can then uh, apply some ultrasonic uh, uh, or megasonic energy to that bath, and that will cause an aerosol to form by basically uh, cavitating the, the ink. You get the mist uh, within the vial, and that mist consists of microscale droplets, which carry your nanomaterial. The carrier gas will come in, pick up those droplets, and take it to the print head. And at the print head, a second gas focuses your aerosol stream. And so you can get nice uh, uh, laminar flow regions of about three to seven millimeters in length, which allow you to kind of print from large working distances, including conformally over curved surfaces if you design your uh, print files correctly. We still have to do a thermal or a UV center um, to functionalize uh, the printed film. Uh, but some of these tools also have in situ laser centering. So you, you know, with the laser that's on the tool set, you can come back and go over your print and just do laser centering um, after after you print your your structures. Aerosol can get to lower uh, feature size than inkjet, so we can get down to about 10 micron uh, feature size. Viscosity is a little more forgiving because we do have a pressurized atomizer, so we can go up to about a thousand centipoise. If we're using the ultrasonic atomizer, we want to stay in the range of inkjet. And our particle size can be a little bigger for this uh, print technology, up to about 300 nanometers. And still have to take into account the different solvents. The last printer that we have at our disposal is a plasma jet printer. And plasma jet printing is a technology that came out of NASA Ames Research Center um, and was commercialized by a company called Space Foundry with the goal of printing electronics in space. And so it works a lot like the aerosol jet printer that you generate your aerosol stream. But instead of a sheath gas uh, at the nozzle, it goes through a cold atmospheric plasma at the nozzle. And so that plasma affords a few things. One, it helps dry the solvents. Uh, it also helps clean the surface so you can get better adhesion. Uh, you could uh, design your plasma to do plasma chemistry on the particles. And so uh, after you print, you could also just turn off your ink flow and then retrace with the plasma to do plasma sintering of your particles. And so this uh, is a pretty versatile tool. Um, and it's been recently demonstrated to work in microgravity environment by uh, Space Foundry as well through parabolic flight. So the feature size, this is still, I would say, uh, um, uh, early stage uh, system, uh, but we've gotten down to about 100 micron feature size. Uh, so there's still work to do in, in increasing the spatial resolution. Centipoise uh, is a one to five centipoise range for viscosity. Particle size, we've been able to print large aspect ratio um, nano rods, nano tubes with this uh, printer up to about one micron in length. And it works best with water-based inks because you are running uh, running it through a plasma. So we try to avoid um, harsh organic solvents. OK, so what goes into making an ink for these jetting platforms? right? So first thing we want to do is think about the application and what uh, material we want to use for that application, whether that's energy harvesting, energy storage, conductors, or, or passive elements. And so once we've identified uh, the material, we go to synthesizing nanoparticles. And we could do that through um, one of two ways. Uh, we call the top-down approach as physical uh, destruction of a bulk material. And that could be done through milling, um, uh, laser ablation, spray, spray paralysis, uh, things of that nature. And so that could be like high-energy ball milling, three-roll milling, for example. Um, and that typically gives you a, a powder 
of nanoparticles. On the chemical route, we call this the bottom-up approach, and we can use reactions like polyol, solvable thermal, um, liquid phase exfoliation to get kind of uh, the particles within a solution, and then we end up with the solution of nanoparticles. And that solution is not necessarily ready to be an ink for these jetting platforms. So we then have to pick our printer and then go about uh, formulating the ink. And that can involve things like adding binders, sol uh, the, designing the solvent systems, and the stability of the particles in the, uh, those solvents. Uh, and then we go into characterizing the ink, printing, and doing our test prints and reformulate as needed. What we're really targeting is uh, tuning the relationship between the OSARGE number and the Reynolds number. And in the OSARGE number, the viscosity is here in the um, numerator, where the surface tension of ink is down in the under the square root in the denominator, the density as well. And then this is a, a nozzle diameter of the printer. On the Reynolds number side, we have to take into account the gas density, uh, the gas flow, cross-sectional area of the nozzle, and then the viscosity is down here in the denominator, and here's the diameter of, of, of the nozzle. And so when we plot these against each other, we end up with this window here, where if the ink is too viscous, it won't print. If it's not viscous enough, we get a lot of satellite droplets forming, a lot of splashing, um, and that may uh, affect the quality of the print, um, printed features. And so we really want to be within this printable window, which is about 0.1 to 1 on the OSARGE number and uh, about uh, 2 to uh, 100 on the Reynolds number. And these data here are just out of my team showing that we can tune our co-solvent vehicles for these nanoparticles in and outside of that uh, printable window. And here's kind of our library of inks showing that we can do everything from oxides, 2D materials to different metals. And so we do a lot of characterization in this process through dynamic light scattering to look at the hydrodynamic size of the particle uh, in solution, and then surface tension through pendant drop and contact angle to see how it interacts with the substrate. So this is really what we're uh, trying to design our ink towards. And then we do take into account some process parameters uh, especially when it comes to uh, aerosol jet printing. So the focusing gas uh, ratio uh, is the sheath gas over the carrier gas. We have to account for the total gas flows and impinging jet velocity on the um, print process side to get quality prints. So uh, next few slides just kind of show uh, an example of what we've done uh, recently with gold nanoparticles towards this process, right? And so uh, for generating a gold ink, uh, which has been uh, shown to be compatible with the, these three different printers. We start with two grams of hydrogen tetrachlorate hydrate, uh, mix that into water, uh, nano pure water, which contains about four grams of polyvinyl perillodone as a surfactant or a capping agent. Um, and then we manually drop in about six milliliters of sodium borohydride as a reducing agent to uh, pull the gold out of this uh, precursor. Right? And based on the kinetics of that reaction, we can tune the particle size uh, for controlling the heat and the time of the reaction. We did some TEM analysis and we find that our particles using this process are about six to 50 nanometers in diameter. Uh, and that corresponds well with the surface plasma resonance mode that we measured with UV viz. And then we disperse this in various co-solvents. The details of all that are in this uh, uh, ACS materials uh, paper uh, uh, by Tony Varghese, uh, my uh, research scientist working in my group. So we look at various co-solvent systems to get the right viscosity and surface tension to tune into that printable window. And so here's an example where we measure surface tension for this and we see our particle size in solution is about 100 nanometers. So we're getting some agglomeration, but the shear stress versus shear rate is linear and viscosity is constant over shear rate showing we have good Newtonian behavior of our ink. And our co-solvent system is also designed to induce Marangoni flow and these convective currents as the ink dries. So we end up with a nice uniform film of gold instead of gold at the meniscus edge in a coffee ring effect. And then we uh, look at the interactions with different substrates like uh, tattoo paper, polyimid, uh, PET, PEL60, just to show that we have good wettability across a variety of surfaces with the, the sink. Uh, here's an example of how we printed with aerosol jet printing at different focusing gas ratios. And what we uh, see is that at a focusing ratio of two, we get our highest resolution print about 15 microns. It's a 15 micron scale bar. So we're getting very good pushing the limits of the, of the system. And we can print different structures like these host horseshoe structures for stretchable electronics. We've since improved on our process and gotten better control of the kinetics to control the particle size. And so uh, if we can reduce the particle size to sub 10 nanometers or around 10 nanometers, 
even if we have just a few of those in the in the distribution, we could induce a melting point depression in, in the gold. So gold typically melts at about a, a little over a thousand degrees Celsius, but in this reduced nanoparticle size form, we can see through in situ TM analysis that we are starting to get good centering at as low as 50 to 75 degrees Celsius, where the particles are starting to coalesce. And if we go all the way up to 200 degrees Celsius, we see very nice grain growth, uh, which um, also correlates to nice electrical conductivity in our printed films. And so we've demonstrated uh, different prints with this on different substrates, uh, just various test structures on polyimid, eight segment display on paper, uh, EMG sensors on uh, PET, and then through the plasma jet printing process, we also can print and do self-centering of this gold ink, uh, just are just electrodes uh, highlighting uh, uh, connected to an LED, uh, showing good flexibility and ability to print on plastics and paper. So we really got our start in this program through a collaboration with NASA Ames Research Center and their in, uh, participation in NASA's in-space manufacturing program. So if you're not familiar with this challenge, uh, and why in-space manufacturing um, is of interest to NASA it really comes from their need to resupply spare parts to the International Space Station, um, which uh, they spent send about 3,000 kilograms of spare parts uh, every year at a cost of about 70 million US dollars per year. And this is uh, to ISS, which is a low Earth orbit, right? Only about 400 uh, kilometers away. Um, and so NASA has announced and, and is working on their Artemis mission which aims to put um, uh, humans back on the moon uh, uh, and they need to resupply that mission. And the moon will be about 400,000 kilometers away. And then ultimately Artemis hopes to go to Mars. And if we're gonna be resupplying that mission, that's about 225 million kilometers away. So we can just imagine the resupply of spare parts and the costs growing exponentially. And so therefore the need to manufacture spares in, uh, in a microgravity and space environment um, is of, of significant interest uh, to NASA. And the first in space manufacturing done by NASA was actually structural components done in 2014. We can see astronaut Barry uh, uh, Wilmore here holding the 3D printed wrench made by uh, Made in Space, right? And this is just uh, filament extrusion technology. Uh, but about 30% of the failures on ISS are electronics in nature. And so NASA is now uh, interested in printing uh, electronics on ISS through their on-demand manufacturing of electronics. To do this, we really need to develop these multifunctional inks. And that's where my team has been working with them uh, to develop uh, 2D materials and other, other materials into the, the elements for uh, printing circuits and, and devices uh, in, uh, for the Artemis and, and these missions. Um, we've also helped them down select the, the printers. So they've now focused on extrusion-based printing and laser centering. Um, and the, um, the Space Foundry uh, system is still of interest for plasma jet printing and microgravity after their demonstration of parabolic flight. And what they hope to print as one of their uh, demos is a fully printed um, wearable sensor to monitor astronaut health. And so that's their AstroSense sensor. And these different colors represent different functional uh, layers of that sensor, including power, the electrochemical layer for sweat sensing, uh, microfluidics, and, and just the package itself as well. And so they hope to do all this and uh, demonstrate the print on ISS through Fab Lab in 2025, and then move that towards Gateway, which will be the Lunar Space Station and have a fabrication facility on Gateway, and then ultimately on the lunar surface. So we started working with them on, on this project and to develop uh, thermoelectrics uh, for energy harvesting from the body heat for the AstroSense sensor, as well as the electrochemical layers. But I'll start by talking just about the um, uh, this telluride work we did for harvesting thermal energy. And so just a quick recap, if you're not familiar with uh, um, thermoelectrics, they leverage uh, the uh, Peltier effect to harvest uh, heat uh, into electrical energy. So you have your N-type and P-type uh, thermoelectric materials connected in series uh, and in parallel with the temperature gradient. And these materials should have a good Seebeck coefficient for your target um, operating temperature. Um, and that Seebeck coefficient, the details are here, but it's the change in voltage over the temperature gradient. And this goes into the figure of merit in the numerator, um, where the figure, the numerator is known as the power factor. And so that includes the electrical conductivity, the Seebeck coefficient squared. And this is over the thermal conductivity, which includes the lattice contribution from phonons, as well as the electronic contribution from the electrons. 
uh, bismuth telluride was of a material of interest just because of its seabed coefficient is uh, the peak seabed coefficient is near room near room temperature. And so we set about generating bismuth telluride nanoparticles using solvent thermal synthesis. This was a collaboration with uh, Zhao Fang Duan at UCLA, where we just take our reaction media and our precursors, bismuth and tellurium containing precursors, put those in a beaker, heat it up to 195 degrees Celsius, let the reaction occur for about three hours, then we can centrifuge this out, collect the particles, and do the analysis. Right? Um, we've since taken the solvable thermal method and improved it through a hot injection method, where we separate the precursors from the reaction media, uh, heat them separately at 60 degrees Celsius, and use a syringe pump to have more control over the reaction. Um, and so what we did here is just a time series of AFM images uh, where we stopped the reaction at one minute uh, four, six, uh, 10, 15, 20, et cetera. And what we found is that at 20 minutes, we actually get nice crystalline domains of these thermoelectric nanoplatelets. And so uh, their lateral size can range from about 300 to 700 nanometers, uh, but that's still good for aerosol jet, maybe not for inkjet. And then here you can see uh, kind of the, the corresponding width over time as well. And so at about 20, 20 minutes, um, we're getting an average of about 400 nanometers on the flake width. We didn't see much dependence on the thickness. They're all about 35 nanometers thick. Um, but, um, you know, they're still good for aerosol jet, plasma jet printing. So we did some TEM analysis uh, to look at the crystallinity of the flakes. And we have the AFM data, but here we can see the single atoms showing good crystalline nature, good diffraction uh, of these flakes. We did EDS mapping to show the elemental distribution of bismuth and tellurium. We have nice even distribution with the right two to three ratio. And then we just uh, did some thin film fabrication through spin coating and aerosol jet printing to show that we can get good uh, temperature sensing or, or uh, heat harvesting from these devices. And so that's shown here where we um, put this in a temperature difference of just uh, four degrees Celsius. And we see a nice uh, voltage rise of about 200 microvolts indicating we have good thermoelectric performance. And then we looked at the robustness of, of the film as printed compared it to screen printed or previous screen printed films and show that uh, after a thousand bend cycles over 50 millimeter radius of curvature, we're getting about a 20% change in the uh, resistance, which would impact the power factor. Where we're moving now is to increase power density for these devices. And we're doing that through this folded origami approach where we can connect these thermoelectric legs in series and then fold them up to get a higher power density. So that was, uh, we showed that we could do that with spin coating and aerosol jet printing, but the same ink could be used in uh, plasma jet printing as well. And so uh, working with Harish Subaraman, who's now at Oregon State University, uh, we showed that we can control the plasma jet characteristics or the plasma characteristics um, through the uh, gas flows and the uh, voltage applied to generate the plasma. Those details are in this nanoscale paper here led by uh, Jacob Manzi. But we show that at different gas flows, we can get different laminar flow regions for the plasma plume. And uh, that does impact the quality of the print as detailed here. But probably the most interesting thing was um, when we did just uh, morphology analysis of the printed films through scanning electron microscopy, what we saw from top view and side view here is that the porosity of the film as deposited was about 90%. And so that plasma is charging the particles and creating extra um, uh, porosity. So we had to add a cold compaction step where we just squeeze this between two Teflon sheets, and then we were able to get good conductivity and, and actually get some power harvesting from the thermoelectrics deposited deposited with plasma jet printing. And so our, uh, shown here is just uh, eight nanowatts was kind of our peak power at 70 degrees Celsius uh, temperature gradient, uh, which is good enough for some sensing applications. And what we did also see is that after 10,000 bend cycles, over a really aggressive radius of curvature of eight millimeters, we're only getting a 10% change in the resistance. So these are, are adhering better and holding together a little bit better than aerosol jet films. So while uh, it's of interest to power the wearable sensors, NASA has a lot of other energy harvesting interests in ISS and outside ISS. So we sent some of these films on the X-37B platform. This is the Air Force um, orbiter uh, to expose them to low Earth orbit. And so this is known as a materials exposure and technology innovation platform for space or, or the MEDIS program. And it works a lot like the MISI program on ISS where you basically just have your different materials coupons 
put them outside the orbiter for a period of time, in this case, six months, uh, and then they return it back to Earth and you can recollect the samples. And so this is just a, a, pre a snippet of the press release where these um, films, these printed electronic films uh, came back to Earth in November, 2022, including our thermoelectric legs uh, shown here. I think uh, we never did get them back from NASA to um, characterize their performance after exposure to low Earth orbit, but it's still exciting for us nonetheless. So I'm going to pivot now to a little bit of uh, energy. Once we harvest energy, how do we store it? And to that, we go to electrochemical energy storage devices or, or supercapacitors. And so um, supercapacitors in general can have uh, two, uh, two configurations. You can have these uh, stack configurations where you have your current collectors, um, and then they're covered with your active material and then some kind of electrolyte in between. So there's kind of a sandwich structure. Or you can have these interdigitated electrodes where your current collectors still cover with your active material, but the electrolyte is then just spanning the IDE structure, right? And supercapacitors are of interest because they bridge the power density and energy density of uh, capacitors and batteries. So they're in a nice middle ground, and that's because of their electric double layer storage and pseudocapacitance storage mechanisms. Um, and so they can deliver a lot of power uh, rapidly, which is good for things like uh, supporting the braking systems in electric vehicles, for example. It's just one application uh, for supercapacitors. For this, we move away from this metalluride and we go to a new class of materials known as maxines. And if you're not familiar with maxines, these are etched out of max phase ceramics, where M is an early transition metal. A could be any of these elements shown here in the blue box. It's largely aluminum, silicon, and germanium, what's been reported in literature. And then X is carbon or nitrogen. And so uh, these uh, max phases can have different stoichiometries of M, M plus one. Uh, A is typically just one, and then X to the N, right? And so most recently, I think the 5-4 family has been discovered by Chris Shuck from, uh, he was in Yuri Gagoski's group at Drexel at the time, and he's now a professor at Rutgers. Um, so we have uh, everything from 2-1 to 5-4 ratios for the maxine synthesis. And these could be single transition metals. It could be solutions of different transition metals. And they can even include ordered uh, heterostructures of the transition metals. So a wide uh, variety of different family of maxines are available. About 60 of them uh, have been experimentally re realized with thousands uh, predicted. Right? Once we have the max phase ceramic uh, to get to the maxine, we actually have to remove that A element. And so we do that through following Yuri Gagoski's uh, work through the mild method, where we generate in situ HF through um, lithium chloride and uh, or lithium fluoride and hydrochloric acid. Um, so that reaction will create HF, which can selectively remove the aluminum layer in a type three, uh, C2, type three aluminum C2 max phase, for example. And so well, we let that reaction occur for about a week and we monitor the pH uh, over that time to kind of uh, understand when the reaction is complete. And then we do a lot of XRD analysis to ensure that these things are fully etched and we have the maxine layers. So you can see that here on, on this plot, you know, we just do this uh, over time. Once it's completely etched and neutralized, the maxines are kind of a really thick, viscous uh, fluid uh, clay. We put that on a Teflon dish, and then we can collect our maxine papers, which we can then redistribute into our different solvents to formulate inks. And so what's interesting with these is that this reaction, uh, this etch, during this etch process, you can get a lot of different surface functional groups because you have a lot of different reactions occurring. And so we can end up with fluorine, uh, hydroxyls, hydrogen, oxygen on the surface of the flake, which can then impact uh, their properties uh, for different applications and their performance for different applications. Typically, these are large microscale flakes that we get from the edge process. So if we want to make them compatible with the material setting platforms, we have to reduce the particle size. And so to do that, we do that through probe tip sonication. You can see that uh, uh, photo here where the probe tip sonicating horn actually goes through a PDMS membrane and into the uh, solution of maxines. Um, and this is all sealed under an argon environment. So we're really trying to minimize the oxidation of the titanium uh, layer, which can become more reactive at the nanoscale. Um, and then we do, after the sonication, DLS. You can see that we can reduce the particles down to the around 500 to 600 nanometer range uh, in solution. And so that works well with the aerosol jet printer. Uh, these are just SEM and TEM images showing the reduced particle size morphology but they do retain their nice layered structure. To make the ink, we can disperse these in different solvents. We're using a good, right now, 
a mix of ethanol and um, ethylene glycol. Uh, and uh, that gives us a nice Newtonian behavior for the ink, low centipoise for the ultrasonic atomizer. Then we looked at contact angle to understand wettability on our printed gold uh, films, um, and also just kind of look at the surface tension to make sure we're in that jettable window. So to make the supercapacitors, we actually start by printing our current collectors, uh, for which we're using our, our uh, in-house generated gold ink. So we use the aerosol jet printer, print the current collectors in an IDE structure. We anneal that at 350 to remove solvents in the PVP. Um, and this is done on polyimid. And then we come over with the aerosol jet printer, retrace the IDE structure, and deposit the vaccine layers. And we can do this in a number of passes, a single pass, um, a, a two passes or three passes, and get different amount of maxine material on the current collectors, going from about uh, 360 nanometer uh, all the way up to 1.3 microns. So we, we have good control over uh, the film thickness and the correspondingly, the resistance decreases with the more maxines that we deposit. So we can then take this uh, um, IDE structure and dip it in the electrolyte to look at the super uh, capacitor performance. Uh, we did this both in organic and ionic gel uh, electrolytes. For the organic electrolyte, we're using uh, sodium uh, perchlorate and uh, uh, propylene carbonate. Uh, and then we do the cyclic voltometry to understand the capacitance behavior of, of, of this uh, system. And so you can see here, the CV gives us a nice uh, rectangular kind of response. And the GCD, um, galvanic, charge, uh, galvanic charge and discharge curves, are also symmetric. And so this tells us that our uh, charge storage mechanism is largely in the electric double layer. And then we can integrate these curves to get to the aerial capacitance, divided by the total area of the electrodes. That'll give us the aerial capacitance. And we can see that that scales well with the number of passes. We stopped at, at, at three passes because if we add more maxines, they start to delaminate off the surface. Um, so we benchmark this against the literature, and we can see here the aerial capacitance for the organic electrolyte, and then the um, gel electrolyte is outperforming some of the best prints uh, of Maxine electrochemical devices uh, in the literature. Um, and then when we do the volumetric, uh, the inkjet printed work that was reported in this uh, paper by Valeria Nicolesi's team, um, is uh, that, that performance goes up, but our gel electrolyte still uh, has more charge storage capacity. And so then we can also look at other printed devices in literature and see that this uh, Maxine's and the gold current collector offer a route towards really high performance uh, supercapacitors. Uh, it turns out Maxine's are also good for energy uh, harvesting. And so for that, we go towards the triboelectric effect where we um, uh, can basically put an electron donor in contact with an electron acceptor to harvest uh, the charge through mechanical stimulus. And so it's a lot like just uh, static charge if you've ever rubbed your feet across a carpet and, and shocked one of your younger siblings. Uh, but to do char harvest this uh, triboelectric effect, um, we mix the maxines in with a polymer. We're using PVPVA, uh, which has a good dielectric constant. It's more eco-friendly for this type of application than some of the fluorinated carbons. Then we just mix that together with a shear mixer and ethanol. Uh, and if we add enough maxines, enough PVPVA, we get a nice viscous uh, ink, which is compatible with extrusion printing. And we can print that directly on uh, an electron acceptor layer. Or, uh, 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 we're using aluminum uh, foils for that. And so if you're not familiar with things, our working mechanism is uh, something like this, right? Where you can kind of start with uh, um, your Tang device. We're using a single electro configuration. So we have our PVPVA Maxine uh, film on aluminum, and then you can touch it just with your uh, finger, right? And when you're in contact, that uh, charge is um, uh, equalized and you're kind of neutral, no, no charge is generated. As you begin to separate um, the, your finger from the device, you're gonna induce some uh, charge redistribution, you'll generate a voltage, and then eventually at far enough distance, you'll be fully separated and you'll be back to charge neut neutrality. But then as you come back into contact, uh, um, you'll regenerate the opposite voltage. And then as you stay in contact, you'll become charge neutral again. And so over cycles, right, you can imagine doing this over and over, you can get a nice uh, voltage response uh, from this triboelectric nano generator. And so here's kind of just uh, uh, our quick snapshot of this device. So we are generating good voltage um, and good current pulses with this uh, system. We look at different concentrations of maxines mixed in PVPVA 
and we see about a hundred percent increase in the voltage amplitude um, as well as uh, the current magnitude when we go up to 5.5 milligrams per milliliter of maxines mixed into the PVBBA. At this point, uh, if we exceed this, the maxines begin to crash out of the uh, composite. Um, so this was kind of the max concentration we could achieve. But then when we plot the um, voltage and current curves versus the load resistance, we can see our max power density is about 750 milliwatts per meter squared, um, uh, which is pretty good for, for these uh, devices. We can do real work with this, so we can actually have our device connected to a rectifier circuit and different capacitors, and we can do that uh, to uh, charge the capacitor and actually use that energy to then uh, illuminate an array of LEDs. This should say A and ML, for example. That's 34 LEDs. Uh, so moving on, uh, away from now the printed, I want to start moving, well, uh, uh, away from energy devices, talk a little bit more about uh, how we're working with uh, silicon and moving towards addressing some of the issues in computing. Uh, one of the key things that we've been working on here is integration of 2D materials with silicon photonics. Um, so uh, we all know that cloud computing has been uh, on the rise um, with the uh, uh, release of social media, AI, right, and, and the need for large data centers, which are consuming a lot of energy. And there's also a need to transfer a lot of data, and that's typically done through these uh, so-called light chips, where the silicon photonics um, are directly integrated with uh, um, uh, silicon ICs as well, uh, or, and, and typically this is done with compound semiconductors as well. So you're basically carrying the light through the telecom, through the optical fiber, and it comes into the um, photo detector, which is usually compound semiconductors, which can convert it back to electrical energy, right? Um, so here we're mixing two different foundries, right? Silicon and compound semiconductors, which aren't always compatible. And, and so folks have to actually bond these chips together. Um, and these individual light chips can have about six of these devices per chip, right? And so we have to have a lot of them to connect to the server blade. And the goal is to increase the number of light chips uh, or devices per light chip so we can have greater bandwidth and reduce energy consumption. Right? So for this, we're turning back to can we print active optoelectronic materials directly on silicon at the right telecom wavelengths, right? And so for that, we started working with iris light technologies uh, to use uh, black phosphorus as the active optical layer and print directly over silicon photonics, right? And so the, uh, black phosphorus, if you're not familiar, is one of these 2D materials that has a layer dependent band gap. It's uh, in the bulk or near bulk, it's right at the right telecom wavelength, right? So here's kind of the um, black phosphorus uh, uh, but when we get to five layers, for example, we're right at 15, 15 nanometers, which is uh, ideal for this application. So uh, this plot just kind of shows our ability to make inks out of um, uh, chemical vapor transport black phosphorus crystals. And so we can see here uh, just the bulk black phosphorus. And then after exfoliation, we retain the right Raman peaks. We look at the ratio of the A1G to A2G as an indication of oxidation in the phosphorus system. Um, and so here's kind of a nice map uh, uh, showing that the ratio stays uh, well below the 0.5, um, which is kind of the indicative of the oxidation. We get large crystalline domains, which are uh, shown through the diffraction pattern of TEM. And you can see that they're about hundreds of nanometers on, on edge. And then we can look at the UV vis and the uh, absorption um, and just kind of see that when we compare to bulk, and, and this is the PL, right? We have the, the right UV vis uh, kind of spectra for this. But when we look at PL, we can look at the bulk. We have nothing in the visible. Um, but when we exfoliate, we get to a few layers, which gives us some of uh, the visible um, uh, character in the, the PL spectra, right? And then in the XPS, we have minimal oxidation. So we did uh, formulate an ink out of this for aerosol jet printing. Um, we see that it's compatible with the aerosol jet. and first print our institutional graffiti. We could do this conformally over curved surfaces. So we've done this on graphene just to demonstrate heterostructures. Um, we've done this on tattoo paper if we need wearable devices on TMDs for visible and the kind of near IR um, uh, photonics. And we can make electronic devices like diodes out of this as well. On the uh, other challenge in computing is really um, how much energy consumption the, the data centers take but from the transistor point of view, right? So data center power consumption has been on the rise. And by 2030, uh, 
the complete uh, information computing technology infrastructure is expected to overcome uh, all the power requirements of the entire of world's global or, or nuclear energy production, right? Just as a benchmark. And that really comes from the transistor uh, that we are using and the materials in the current transistor architecture. So 2D materials uh, are one path that the semiconductor industry is looking at to replace silicon and improve uh, energy consumption by uh, processors. So this needs scalable synthesis approaches to integrate 2D materials in 3D uh, monolithic heterogeneous integration fashion. So how do we get 2D materials to stack nicely um, uh, on different dielectrics so that we can make multi-layer uh, 2D ribbon fence uh, for processing applications? For that, we've turned to MOCVD, metal organic chemical vapor deposition, which basically involves the precise delivery, delivery of metal organics and hydride precursors in the gas phase of the substrate. So this little cartoon here shows that uh, by controlling the precursor gases, we can insert our uh, transition metal uh, containing uh, precursor. Um, so we're using molycarbonyl, tungsten carbonyl, uh, and then we mix that with hydrogen sulfide, right? And so that can help uh, start the nucleation on the substrate. And over time, that nuclei will grow until you have a coalesced film, right? There's a lot of substrate treatments that go in this. We have to control temperature, pressure, gas flows, a lot of process parameters to optimize this growth. So uh, my student went to Penn State University to learn the, the fundamentals of MOCBD, working with Joan Redring uh, and her team through the 2D Crystal Consortium program. And so they really did a lot of work on uh, MOCBD of MOS2 and WS2 using these horizontal quartz tube reactors, which were built in-house by Penn State. And so this is basically inductive heating for the substrate. The gas flows and the precursors come in through one side of the quartz tube and exhaust out the other, right? Um, we've also uh, here at Boise State recently acquired an Axtron close couple shower head system for MOCVD growth of these films. And the advantage here is that you can see, if you look closely, kind of this array of uh, holes in the, the top of the shower head. So we get vertical flow of our gases instead of horizontal. Um, and the gases are perpendicular to the wafer surface. So we can take a four hour growth from horizontal reactor geometries and do the same growth in 10 minutes uh, on multiple wafers, which are rotating uh, with the shower head system, right? And so uh, it's a much more industry uh, scalable uh, uh, technology than the horizontal quartz tube. So uh, this field for TMDs is still in its, um, I'd say it's still in its early stages. And so there's a, a lot to optimization here and, and fundamental discovery. But we started into this by just comparing the reactor geometries um, and uh, looking at different process parameters to see what quality of film we can get for these TMDs. So if we look here uh, across the top is the horizontal quartz tube TMDs that we grew at Penn State. On the left are molybdenum disulfide. On the right is tungsten disulfide. And across the bottom is the showerhead uh, system, the Axtron system. So in both cases, we were able to get coalesced films across the entire 50 millimeter wafer. Uh, I will say the horizontal quartz tube didn't quite go out to the edge, um, but in both cases, we got good films. Uh, the horizontal quartz tube, you can tell from the AFM morphology, gives us larger crystalline domains of high quality, right? Uh, so larger basal planes on hundreds of nanometers. Uh, but in both cases, the WS2 is of poorer quality than the MOS2. We did some Raman mapping to kind of quantify the um, percent of bilayer, multi-layer coverage. Um, it's basically uh, the end result here is we have about 60 to 70% monolayer coverage, uh, particularly for the MOS2 um, by looking at the peak separation, mapping the peak separation of the um, E prime and A prime peaks uh, uh, of the Raman spectra. And so we also did some Kelvin probe force microscopy. Um, all these details for this are published in this RSC advances paper. But one thing to note is when we look at the horizontal geometry, we see a good correlation between the KPFM and the morphology. Um, and that's kind of shown here with this hexagonal platelet. You can also see it in the KPFM data. Um, but on the shower head reactor, we don't have very good correlation. So the surface charge is uh, quite distributed differently for the shower head reactor. So it may be a more defective film with more oxygen or uh, other kind of defects at the uh, edge of the domains impacting the KPFM data. Um, nonetheless, we are moving towards devices with these films, uh, working with Axtron. This is just an example where we've 
uh, developed a contact photolithography method where we can do this directly on transparent substrates so we don't have to transfer our films off sapphire you can see the mos2 film pattern directly on sapphire here um, we also have tlm structures on this uh, uh, wafer so we can look at contact resistance and uh, transfer length um, these are about 100 um, uh, raman spectra uh, stacked on top of each other throughout the process in this little window here we don't see any drift in the raman so we're not really impacting the quality of the film then we do have a lot of transistors on this and so you can see the family of curves here uh, for some of our first 2D MOS2 transistors uh, fabricated in at an Idaho University. So lots to do um, still in making good high performance devices, um, but we're, we're excited to move forward with that. There's a snapshot of our system. Um, we have a 1400 degree reactor, 1400 degree Celsius reactor is a three by two. So we have the three wafers, um, uh, three two inch wafers at a time. Our tool is configured with five process gases, including hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen selenide for the cacogenides. And we have up to 12 metal organic sources. Um, so we can do um, hexagonal boron nitride. We can also do gallium nitride, aluminum nitride. And then we're uh, outfitting for some of the TMDs as well. So with that, just want to close and thank the students uh, for their hard work. Fresh on supercapacitors, Ajay on the uh, Tang devices, Florent on DP, and Michael for MOCVD. And I'm supported by a couple of research scientists, Josh Eisenberger and Tony Varghese, who also help mentor the students. And of course, thank all the funding agencies. With that, I'll stop and hopefully have time for a question or two. Okay, thank you so much, Professor uh, Dave. So, somebody have a question to us, or feel free to raise your hand. Okay, so we have one question. I have one question. In, it is, uh, you explained about the inject printer for semiconductor. Are there any approach like uh, using the laser jet technology uh, for printing uh, also semiconductors? Uh, I haven't paid as much attention to laser jet, but um, that's a good question. So um, I, I'm not aware of it, uh, but if you if you're aware of any, I'm, I'd be happy to look into it. Um, yeah, I imagine there are right. I think laser jet, you have a powder, and then you hit it with the laser, hit the drum with the laser to uh, get the powder to come off. Is that right? Um, so yeah, maybe two D materials could work well for that in the powder form. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so if we don't have uh, any further question, so I think we, uh, I ask you to join me to thank you, Professor um, Dave. Uh, I think that's all. Great, thank you.